debate in the uh, media around some of the concerns that we in the group have been talking about for quite some time, um, including the real basics around the skill shortage in the UK for teaching people who want to go into the fashion industry, um, around the minimum living wage and the living wage, around um, the disproportionate number of women who are affected by poor employment employment practice and unsustainable employment practice in the sector. We've had um, a number of um, specific examples of um, famous labels who um, some of whom are trying very hard to do the right thing and others who are still miles behind. Um, we've also had some really um, geopolitical discussions around the use for example of cotton which comes comes from the Xinjiang region of China, where we know that there are Muslim communities who are experiencing inhumane and degrading treatment, um, and some of their uh, community are used in um, really questionable employment practices. So um, we have done everything in this group from the geopolitical right down to how we cope with the effects of Brexit. We do want a sustainable uh, fashion industry, whether we're consumers, whether we're lawmakers, or whether we work in the area of fashion development. Um, and of course, at the end of life of garments, we also want to see a more sustainable outcome uh, around the um, recycling. We know that about 60% of garments are recycled, which is a, quite a good kind of um, level. However, there's no reason why we couldn't get that up to 85 or 90% um, with a bit more political effort. Um, and for that, we need to have more investment in education, more investment in um, understanding the technology behind fibres and textiles, but also a concerted effort from across local government, regional government, national government, and in the face of COP26, even internationally, to talk about what we do at end of life of garments. So that is a massive overview. In the chat box, you should be able to see that we've got the Cleaning Up Fashion Report which Jody has sent around. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Hilary, Tamara and the team for putting together what is a really exciting report. And you will be seeing Lola soon doing press rounds, talking about this and trying to promote sustainability because Lola has been focusing on this area for more years than I've been in Parliament. So we have a fantastic parliamentary presence um, and we want to continue to get that debate going, but importantly, to get action, spe specifically in regards to the COP26 um, climate summit in Glasgow in the autumn, we need to press on a real commitment to change now from all the partners involved in the report. And I hope that today's session goes very well. Thank you, and back to you, Tamara. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I agree with what you've said 110%. Of course, this APPG is in a new incarnation, but was uh, started in 2011. Um, and when I met Baroness Lola Young, um, I was working in Parliament and we met talking about the issues around modern slavery and the fashion industry. And um, that's six years ago now. And I think that you know, you've been a leading light in this dialogue and in pushing this up the agenda, and that is to be applauded. And when I took on for Fashion Roundtable the role of secretariat of this APPG, it was very clear that what needed to happen was a conversation which not only talked about the environmental impacts, but also the ethical impacts of the industry and its and its responsibility. And I note that one of our evidence givers at the Awash Foundation, which is based in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. sharing insights of, of um, a fire that happened only um, a few days ago in a food factory in Bangladesh. I don't think it was a fashion factory. And um, it goes to show, and it comes to the heart of why we do this work and why we are pushing on these agendas, not only at a local level, whether it's, whether it's to the edges of Catherine's constituency in M4 or it's Leicester, but equally with our global partners across the global supply chain. So very much within the evidence of this report, we were actually very lucky to be able to do this during a lockdown because we were able to get insights from people based in Washington, based in, I think there was someone from San Francisco, from Bangladesh and from all over the world. And I don't think that would have been as possible with a parliamentary evidence session happening in the House of Lords or House of Commons. Um, also, thanks to our survey, everybody who chose to take part in that survey, whether they were a consumer, whether they were in education or they were a business leader, <laughs> were able to have, participate and have their say. Um, and I felt that that was something that we did really well because 
fashion can either seem very um, one level or the other, and, and this group really brings it into the round, and I'm, I'm very pleased with what we've achieved. Um, the report had several sessions. I know there were a lot of sessions, um, and I think it would be good if Hilary could get the PowerPoint up, and then we're going to hand back to Catherine to introduce who's speaking first. Um, but everybody, if you could just download that uh, link to the report as well, then you can get a feel of what we're talking about here. Thank you very much. Over to Catherine. Yeah, Sarah's just gonna get the slides up on her section, if that's right. Great. So, and Sarah's first, is she, um, Hilary? Yeah, no, it's actually myself. I can, yeah, right. if, uh, um, until we get them up, I can explain what's, uh, what's gonna happen. If you could, uh, right. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so firstly, obviously, um, we've had opening remarks, and then I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run through the findings that the APG had um, on the um, Modern Slavery Act, the Uyghur crisis, and the need for increase in business responsibility um, for brands and retailers. We'll then go on with Laura, we'll then speak to the extended producer responsibility and net zero recommendations. Um, Dillis will speak about just transition and well-being economy and then we'll take a short break just to allow everyone uh, to have a little break from us all speaking uh, for a lo long time at you and then um, we will uh, yeah, resume with just transition and economic indicators issues and opportunities with Fajola and then Tamara will speak about supporting UK manufacturing and onshoring and then we will open up to Q&A's which um, will be hosted by uh, Lola and then we'll closing remarks so that should cover everything and we should hopefully have the slides up shortly for you all to have a look at but yeah so I'll start us off um so yeah I'm the new researcher at Fashion Roundtable I'm going to be taking through the APBG sessions that we had around the modern slavery the Uyghur crisis what's doing that and uh the need for business responsibility in supply chain so um in in terms of the modern slavery findings, we've recommended that we need to expedite mon the Modern Slavery Act promises by the government, as well as introducing a garment adjudicator. I'll just run you through how we came to those recommendations. Um, so whilst the MSA was introduced as a world leading piece of legislation in 2015, it has been found to be lacking a number of areas. Um, these have already been addressed by a number of reviews um, before, including the Environmental Audit Committee, um, as well as the independent review by Frank Field, Baroness butler Sloss, and Maria Miller, which everyone you know, may, may be um, au fait with, and all of which concluded there were significant deficiencies, namely surrounding implementation and enforcement. Now, this is what we found a lot from a lot of the people um, providing evidence to us during the sessions as well. So whilst the government accepted a number of the recommendations from including the modern slavery statement repository which they did so earlier this year there are a number of um that were mentioned that will be implemented when parliamentary time allows and that's key to what we're recommending that those um that that time is expedited um so a few key insights i wanted to share with you um from our evidence sessions included um, Dr Nicholas Hammer at the University of Leicester um, was speaking to us and advocating for the need for mandatory human rights due diligence. Meg Lewis, Labour Behind the Label, um, spoke about how the Modern Slavery Act um, enforcement issues have been exacerbated in the UK because facility searchers are focused on finding people who are not in the, UK, in the country legally rather than revealing um, illegal working practices. So it's, it's more about the, the lens about what the enforcement is doing currently. Uh, Dame Sarah Thornton from the Anti-Slavery Committee the anti-slavery commissioner uh, she recommended that the government support law enforcement by providing more training strengthening victim care and support focus on prevention including increased public awareness as well as introducing a single enforcement body um, so that is a key thing that we'll come back to is the the singular enforcement body and the need to um, improve enforcement um, so that leads to our recommendation um, which ties into Fiona Gooch who gave us evidence um, from Tradecraft Exchange explaining that Bayes urgently needs to establish a garment tr trading adjudicator and this has already been you know this has already been shown to work in other sectors so um, it, and then could be modeled on the groceries code adjudicator um, so, which Tradecraft have found um, in 2014 80% of supermarket suppliers told the GCA they experienced abusive purchasing practices compared to 30% in 2021 so the effects that a garment trade adjudicator could have for the fashion industry are already um, evidence there for the for a separate industry um, so this highlighted to us the need for a single enforcement mechanism and we recommended this alongside the need to expedite the other changes already promised in the modern slavery act but desperately needed we then also um, so the Uyghur crisis um, we held a, a singular 
singular evidence um, session focused specifically on this issue, um, which allowed us to hear from a number of CSO representative, representatives, um, most poignant being um, Rahima Mahmoud of the UK project director at World Uyghur Congress, who was able to share um, real personal experiences as well as the personal experiences that have been shared with them, including how Uyghurs in the UK do not feel safe, highlighting that the UK has made very little headway in addressing the issues in East Turkestan, which have existed for much longer than current media interest. And she stated that there was enough information to act. The question is if the UK will. So we also heard from Industrial, who highlighted to us, um, which really highlighted to us the pervasive nature of the issue. Um, she highlighted how um, Xinjiang produces 80% of China's cotton and that China then accounts for over 22% of the world's cotton production. So this is an issue that can't really be avoided um, by brands and suppliers who, who think that they're avoiding it. Um, but it, you know, it's the cotton industry, is that, that percentage of the cotton industry is so pervasive that it really needs to be addressed and looked at by everyone in their supply chains. So we therefore heard from Kate Ferguson, co-exec director and head of research at Protection Approaches. She told us how the UK currently has no formal policy on preventing genocide or combating identity-based violence and widespread discrimination abroad. And she explicitly recommended that the, the government needed to make a declaration of genocide in Xinjiang and they should also halt deportations to China um, and should invite Uyghur representatives to hold discussions with government. Now, I think this is something key that's come up through our from our evidence sessions, that, uh, specifically this one, um, having those direct um, representatives being able to speak with government or to speak with people such as ourselves, it really allows those uh, issues to come to the fore and to be recognised um, at government level. So the, the APPG therefore recommends that the UK government needs to agree and then implement formal policy on preventing genocide and to use this legislation to approach tra trading partners when and where these issues arise. So. This is we, we specifically made this um, re recommendation so that whilst these issues that we're discussing are currently um, occurring in Xinjiang, there's nothing to stop that these would be replicated in other areas. So the recommendation needs to um, focus on you know, the issue that can be um, transferred to if this happens in other areas again, not just not necessarily just specific to Xinjiang. There, and then um, we moved, I moved on to this sort of slightly, those two were our governmental recommendations. And then we had recommendations for the sector. Um, and specifically, this is looking at increasing business responsibility for apparel supply chains. Now, the treatment of suppliers by brands during the pandemic is obviously well established. Um, billions of dollars worth of orders were cancelled. Um, and as the campaign helped supply cover over 22 billion dollars worth um, in cancelled orders but they've made very conservative estimates that um, workers are still owed up to 5.8 billion for the first and that's that's just for the first three months of the pandemic alone so I think what we discovered from these evidence sessions was you know what we already potentially knew but that the pandemic exacerbated and brought to the fore the issues that are already occurring within the industry and it just it just made those worse and we heard from a number of um, representatives, some working in Bangladesh themselves, um, who really brought forth, forth to us the sort of the first-hand first -hand issues that this caused. Um, but also, yeah, so as um, Tamara mentioned earlier, Nazma Akhtar, founder of the Awaj Foundation, highlighted to us the loss of work as a result of the pandemic and its clear gendered impact on women who make up a significant amount of the garment workers working in Bangladesh. But she did also highlight how there have been several large scale protests in Bangladesh, indicating the appetite for a change in power dynamics between workers slash suppliers and brands slash retailers. So there is the appetite there and it's the support that's needed for those workers and to be joined and to create a joined up approach across the world. Um, Anna Breyer of Labour Behind the Label reported that some orders were retroactively cancelled after they had been produced, while some eventually paid for these others still refusing to. And highlighted that the most vulnerable supply chain stakeholders are the ones who've been left to bear the brunt of that pan the pandemic. So a BHRRC report highlighted that the, the 16 brands they focused on uh, made $10 billion in profits during the second half of 2020 alone. So I think that's what we really, really came out of the sessions was that profits were still being able to be made whilst these, these um, orders were not being paid for. So yeah, we also heard from Mustafa Udin, who's the CEO of Denim Expert in Bangladesh, and he experienced the impact firsthand. 
he managed, he paid his staff 100% of their wages, putting himself heavily in debt, but he is unable to, he was unable to pay those off those loans until brands were paying for their orders. So he explained about the situation and how it exacerbated the global supply chains um, system of debt and mutual trust. Um, so the majority of suppliers raise loans based on previous invoices to pay for materials, wages, factory costs and shipping upfront when a clothing order is placed. This is general, not during just the pandemic. And this is um, so when, when the order is placed and they can only raise an invoice to be paid once those goods are shipped. And then they often have to wait weeks for payment. He recommended that brands being be, need to be held accountable for the non-payment of wages that women in garment factories must be empowered to join trade unions and a real living wage must be implemented. Um, we also heard from Meg, Le Meg Lewis of the Labour Behind the Label, who noted how poor purchasing practices encourage a system of, of subcontracting and that supply chain transparency is the fundamental fight against labour ex exploitation. So you'll be hearing quite a lot about, I think, transparency during today. Um, and therefore, I just highlight the specific recommendations we made it off the back of those. And that was that, the AP, that we highlight that brands need to overhaul their purchasing practices to ensure that they're not squeezing suppliers to the point that they are creating the conditions for, working, for worker exploitation. Uh, two, that we, they protect and advocate for the freedom of association and collective bargaining. And three, that a comprehensive due diligence to ensure all fundamental human rights are met. So those are the findings of our Three, three, three of the sections of the paper that you'll find um, that link specifically around um, modern slavery and worker exploitation. Obviously, they feed they feed into the other issues uh, throughout that you'll hear throughout throughout the um, the seminar today, the webinar today. And there's a distinct link between the environment, environmental impacts, and worker exploitation, which I will pass on to Laura, who's going to speak about those now. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Laura and I'm the Head of Sustainability at Other Day and co-founder of Lab 2030. Um, give me one minute, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a tech problem. I want to exit your screen so I can see what I'm talking about. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to start with collective action for net zero. We can see that the UK has made important first steps in shifting to a cleaner and more sustainable future, but there is still a long way to go if the UK is to reach net zero by 2050, or indeed make the key changes required by 2030, which is really what we should be aiming for. 72% of our survey respondents were at the top level of concern over the climate crisis, and the fashion industry is known to contribute to excessive water and chemical usage, land use change, biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas emissions and socioeconomic impacts. The fashion industry draws attention to the critical interdependencies between culture, society, the environment and the economy. Indeed, it's important to highlight from the outset that there is a strong link between environmental impacts and exploitative labour in the fashion supply chain. Jessica Sparks, the Associate Director of the Ecosystem and Environment Team at the University of Nottingham's Rights Lab, highlighted to us that because exploitative labour acts as a subsidy, it drives down production costs, and this could act as an incentive for negative behaviours. This shows the urgency to understand the holistic fashion sectoral needs and addresses uh, and issues rather than to consider them in separate silos and illustrate that they should be handled as a whole by UK policymakers. This joined up outlook also needs to be applied to how the industry navigates working with governmental departments. Currently, the sector has to engage across eight government departments, including DCMS, Bayes and DEFRA. An effective Whitehall approach is key to being able to address issues across the industry, which can then be aligned to global alliances and coalitions to achieve a more streamlined and targeted approach to support a coherent sectoral policy and outcomes. For example, the Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action and the Fashion Pact are global coalitions of companies in the fashion and textiles industry. So far, when presented with fashion specific issues, the government has been unable to respond with fashion specific recommendations. But with the approach of COP26 in the autumn, a cohesive approach within government would promote a cohesive response to the issues in the fashion industry. The garment adjudicator mentioned by Hillary could also facilitate this process. The role of the Waste and Resource Action Programme, or RAP, and the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, or SCAP, 
which concluded in 2020, and RAP's ongoing Textiles 2030 initiative offers a sector-based approach, but focuses on one part of the symptoms of, the, um, of a stimulation and supply-led model. And as noted by the, by the EAC in 2019, funding of this work remains limited. There is an opportunity for RAP's work to be escalated if signatories contributed to its funding, but this would have to be done without compromising RAP's impartiality. RAP's targets should be mandatory. Companies with a turnover of more than £36 million should be required to adhere to Textiles 2030, and economic incentives to reduce emissions to net zero should be made clear by the government. Additionally, the ability of MSEs to contribute to the race to zero should be supported. Their approach could also act as prototypes for change at scale and support brands to not have to retrofit these, um, these um, practices into their systems if they're um, put in at the beginning of a brand's journey. This paper recommends for key industries such as fashion, a sectoral thread is needed within government, joining up actions across industries and across governmental departments. I'll now move on to the support for sustainable businesses and waste elimination. The UK buys more than 1.1 million, million tonnes of clothing a year, which equates to around 2.1 billion items of clothing in 2017. But the statistics on the impacts of the fashion industry and its production and waste issues are perhaps not news to any of you. This overconsumption of clothing is paired with a lack of recycling infrastructure. An estimated £140 million worth of clothing is sent to landfill every year, according to RAP, which is a huge waste of resources. We heard from a number of small business owners who suggested various ways that the government could support sustainable businesses. Sophie Slater, the CEO of Birdsong, highlighted the need for subsidised high street store space for social enterprises or community groups. And this sentiment was echoed by Maria Chenoweth of Trade. Slater also suggested tax breaks for B Corps or companies with proven social and environmental contributions, VAT decreases for observation of human rights and supply chain due diligence, or national insurance breaks for companies who face barriers to employing people at living wages. Victoria Prue, the CEO and co-founder of HER, highlighted that the UK rental market is expected to reach £2.3 billion by 2029 and recommended tax breaks for rental models. Through rental systems, thousands of items are rented every month, which reduces the impact of overconsumption and extends item life cycles. It's important to note here that rental feeds the endorphin rush of wearing new clothes without adding to production or consumption levels, but it does not address the reasons why consumption levels have escalated so much in a generation, and rental should not be heralded as the panacea for fixing fashion. Maria Chenoweth, uh, CEO at Trade mentioned that over the past six years, the number of textiles banks has decreased by 42%, but usage has increased by 25%. This indicates that there is increased engagement, but less opportunity to recycle textiles. Chenoweth also highlighted that if people bought more secondhand clothes, this would reduce the impact on the environment because this would mean less clothing consumption and production. The ability of textile recycling facilities in the, um, in the UK is limited and legally binding mechanisms that incentivise waste management are lacking. The government should work closely to support recycling and waste management companies such as the First Mile and also significantly invest in regular collection of clothing waste led by lo local authorities, councils and brands. All of this must come alongside significant investment in incentivi incentivization from the government, including um, the investment in widespread municipal waste facilities, curbside collections and tax breaks for sustainable brands. We just have to look at the thriving Italian textile recycling industry in Preto to um, see the opportunity in harnessing materials that are already in the system. Saying this, in order to truly reduce negative environmental impacts, we first need to tack tackle overproduction and slow the cycle down at source. DEFRA's Extended Producer Responsibility consult uh, Consultation will be the first step towards this. However, encouraging a culture of extended value and re uh, reduced production volume is necessary. This paper recommends that the Extended Producer Responsibility Plans and Wider Waste Strategy should be extended to support resourceful practices and cultures of valuing productions and materials. Okay, that's me done. Thanks.
Thank you very much. And now could we hear from uh, Dillis, please? Hello, everybody, and um, thank you very much, Catherine, Laura, and Tamara, and everybody who's spoken already. Um, as we've heard, uh, these issues are something that is not new, or they're not new to any of us, but this report really extends and amplifies a call to action that recognises the distinctions and the significance of the fashion sector, and that it is like no other sector in relation to climate and social justice. You've heard already clearly about areas for action, um, but also I think you've heard uh, something about, but I want to build on what Laura's has been talking about, about the imperative of the interdependencies between social, environmental, economic and cultural prosperity and what this country really needs. True prosperity is when we've got a state of personal, cultural, economic, societal and environmental thriving that can only take place within planetary boundaries. We have the science-based targets, we know the, the issues from a social perspective, and yet, whilst the fashion sector is a very clear and practical way of being able to look at these things, it is not looked at clearly as a sector. As the ILO states, a just, transi a just transition for all of us towards an environmentally sustainable economy needs to be well managed and uh, looked at as a way to contribute to the goals of decent work for all, social inclusion and the eradication of poverty. This is very stark in the UK and we see it very specifically in relation to the fashion sector. So the intersectionality of these issues of climate and social justice um, are something that we, we can actually, we can grasp quite clearly and quite practically. The fashion sector in the UK, we've heard a lot, and, you, you, um, and if you read the full report, you'll hear a lot more about the atrocities, but we've also found that there, it can be a sector where good place can take, work can take place for all involved. Resourceful practice, environmental stewardship, inclusion in terms of, of, of um, employment and in terms of, of recruitment is taking place. Oh, is that me? Yeah, that is me. Oh, I think there's some kind of noise on my computer. I hope it might go away because I'm not sure what's causing it. Ellis, sorry, it's Tamara here. Is someone calling you on your phone? No, no, they're not. Okay, I think, I think let's just carry on because it's quite a low noise. I'm not hearing it. Okay, so okay. I'll carry on and I, and I won't speak for long because I know we're about to, to have a break as well. And I'm sorry, I, I think my mouse pad, aha, I think my mouse pad got stuck. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just to make sure everybody's <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, um, so yeah, we've already, we, we've heard about the trustees, but we also know that there is good practice that takes place. And we also know that the government has a clear understanding of what could be. The Descriptor report in February this year states very clearly that if we detach nature from economic reasoning, it implies that we consider ourselves to be external to nature and that the fault is not in the economics but it's in the way that we've chosen to practice the economic system and to understand ourselves. So there's probably no other um, area other than fashion that really helps us to look both at the way that we understand ourselves and the way that we do our practice within an economic system. So environmental prosperity is at the heart of, of economic prosperity and a just society is what we call a prosperous society that goes beyond fashion, but fashion has got a very practical way to be able to explore this. And whilst Alex Sharma has said we need business, we need investors driving companies and sectors and the uh, global, global economy towards a green, clean future, we also need governments to recognise their role, to take away the licence to do harm that currently exists. So again, the, uh, citing the Descriptor report, most governments pay people more to exploit nature than to protect it. And we've got evidence in this report that that's the case in fashion in this country. So with this evidence writ large, we need to ask government to support a license to do good via support for those that are already doing good practice and working within planetary boundaries who develop skills in their workforce. Going back to what Catherine said at the beginning, we have fashion designers now who are developing skills within women in marginal communities that could be seen as best practice and yet they are still really struggling to survive. So this other story of a fashion that exists is something that is part of, of we've done some work as Sarah knows on looking at micro and small businesses that take up over 99% of businesses in this country. So they need to no longer be overlooked and under-recognized in, in the race to zero and in considering fashion and its contribution to society. 
So by giving incentives that favor companies with a focus on reuse, repair and extended responsibility and recognizing those who support their workers to join trade unions to upskill and, and look at in-work training and lifelong learning. And this is how green jobs can cre cre be created and meet high standards of working conditions in businesses large and small. So I'll just conclude by saying that there is a way to be able to connect policy across departments if we look at systemic changes across the sector. If we look at the fashion as a sector, it immediately can connect all of those different departments that Laura was talking about. Current activity is siloed, it's reductionist, it's efficiency driven, and this is leading to greater, not less resource use. The emissions trajectory will not meet the targets of, of, of COP26. It will not deal with wealth inequality until it is joined up. Only through a joined up approach across departments that can this hugely significant se sector fulfill its potential to contribute to true prosperity. And it can be um, a business and, a, and a, a way of life and a culture that the UK can be proud of and benefit from. So thank you very much. I'll pass back. Thank you very much. Now, I think Tamara, you're giving us a little break now, aren't you? Is that correct? I believe there's a break now. Um, and what time would you do? I'm not sure whether Catherine is still with us or whether she had to leave. But um, um, just to say, in any case, please do keep some questions coming into the Q&A. There are already uh, one or two there. It's easier if you put them in there rather than the chat, if, if, if that's OK with everybody. Um, it's just easier to gather them all together that way. So um, we'll be having a Q&A after the last session, which will be, Tamara will be back with us talking about how we support UK manufacturing. But meanwhile, um, um, without wishing to usurp um, Catherine, if she's here, let's go into the um, first speaker after uh, the break. I'm delighted to uh, welcome Fiola Condoroli and um, Fiola is going to talk to us about the just transition and economic indicators, issues and opportunities. So it's over to you, Fiola. Thank you so much. So I will briefly talk about what we consider to be the problems with the current state of the fashion industry. Uh, I'll talk how briefly how we got to this point and what are the opportunities uh, and benefits of um, turning into uh, sustainable production. So as we, a lot of us know, the fashion industry is one of the biggest polluters uh, of the environment and it produces around 1.2 billion so tons of um, uh, CO2 annually, which is as much as flights and uh, maritime shipping combined. And this impact of the fashion industry and the environment occurs at all stages from a production to a disposal of the clothes. Uh, the economic loss is due to the unsustainable extraction of resources that is used in production, such as land and water, but as well as the output such as CO2 and waste, and uh, even microplastic pollution of water. Uh, in the current economic system, the industry does not bear the cost of production. The economic value of these, what we call negative externalities of production, is very difficult to quantify. But a recent uh, estimate suggests that there could be around $200 billion in benefits by 2030 if the fashion industry changes uh, the way it does business. Uh, clothing industry uses over 5 trillion liters of water and it accounts for 20% of the water pollution. Uh, there are countries in uh, mostly developing countries that supply cotton for the global, global textile industry and they are at uh, risk of water scarcity to the point that they might have to choose between using water for co cotton production or for drinking. While um, other uh, fibers such as uh, synthetic fibers like polyester that is largely used in the fashion industry uh, use less water and land than cotton, they emit more greenhouse gases. And this synthetic clothing is made up of uh, microplastics that shed during the laundry process and end up in the sea, and which cause uh, harm to the uh, marine life, but potentially also to us humans through seafood consumption. Uh, on the other hand, there are also social costs to the fashion industry and the way it does business currently. The garment industry employs one in six people worldwide, so it is a source of income for millions of people in both developed and developing countries. And yet it is characterized by poor working conditions, 
such as poor ventilation, high heat, low pay, unpaid work, and very low job uh, security. Over 90% of workers in the garment industry worldwide have no negotiating power and wages are kept low on purpose so uh, factories can remain competitive in the supply chain. Uh, for, uh, some estimates suggest that garment workers earn at most 4% of the retail price of an item of clothing. And with the wages that they are paid, it would take a garment worker earning the minimum wage in Bangladesh around 4,000 years to make as much as the CEO of a fashion brand makes in a year. So how did we get here? Over time, the cost of clothing has decreased a lot, both in absolute terms, but also relative to the income of people, especially in richer countries. Therefore, people are uh, able to buy more with less money. Clothing production has doubled between 2000 and 2014, and people buy more clothes and discard them as easily. For example, in the UK, consumption of clothing is higher than in any other European countries, and the average life of clothing is 3.3 years. After that, uh, most clothes are donated or, and or end up in landfills. It is estimated that only 1% of clothing is recycled uh, into new clothing. So in total, around $500 billion is lost worldwide every year as a result of clothing underutilization and lack of recycling. This current model of the industry, which is not limited to just this industry, but the modern economy overall, is the linear model of production, uh, selling, using, and disposing of, which results in unsustainable use of resources, harmful impact on the climate, and uncontrolled waste production. There is a, a lot of potential for change. Uh, recently, there's been an increase in demand from consumers for sustainable clothing. Consumers have become aware of the environment and social cost of production and consumption and are demanding from fashion firms to adapt to sustainable practices. For companies to be competitive, they have to, to adapt to this new market trend. Uh, the reputational risk for brands are high and any brand that will not show willingness to make changes to the current system will fall behind in profits. There are some alternative business models that are being adopted and gaining traction, such as the secondhand market and the rental market. For example, the secondhand market is projected to double in the next five years and is expected to grow 11 times faster than the general re retail sector by 2025. As two in five secondhand consumers are replacing fast fashion with secondhand, uh, secondhand clothing, the sector is projected to be uh, twice as big as fast fashion by 2030. So there are business benefits to adopting to a sustainable economic model. Nevertheless, the government should provide incentive to companies to invest in the initial fixed cost to adapt to these business models. Uh, fortunately, the UK government has already in place some incentives uh, for companies to move towards more climate positive businesses, such as investing 99 million pounds in innovative technology regarding resource and waste management. Companies investing in technologies and practices that enable sustainable production create a value for the overall economy. These benefits include but are not limited to creating new green jobs, improved competitiveness, cleaner air, and enhanced energy resources and better transportation and housing. These benefits translate into healthier and happier societies as they amount to significant health gains, improved living conditions, and a decrease in poverty and inequality. As countries are committed to adopting these economic, economy, green economy practices, it is important that we keep in mind that benefits and costs of this transaction to sustainable production that extends beyond the environmental consideration to include securing workers' rights and livelihoods. Brands must pay garment workers a fair wage, as well as governments uh, have to keep brands accountable for the factory conditions which they hire to outsource their production. Moreover, transparency in supplier lists, wages paid, and responsible purchasing practices is paramount uh, to keeping these brands accountable in the eyes of the public. Thank you. Thank you very much in, indeed, um, Viola. I know that there's going to be um, uh, some interesting questions coming up on some of the points that you've raised, and um, I, I think it's important that we keep those in mind as we progress through um, 
the final presentation for this evening, this afternoon, which is from Tamara, <coughs> excuse me, Tamara Chinchik, whom you, from whom you've already heard um, this afternoon. And she's going to uh, talk about supporting UK manufacturing and onshoring and the levelling up agenda. So it's over to you, Tamara. Thank you, Lola. And thank you to everyone that has come. Um, and I have to say, I've got massive imposter syndrome having listened to everyone else's presentations. I thought they've presented really well. I'm really proud of the work that's gone into this report. Um, I just want to press you, um, anything that we say here about uh, UK manufacturing by just adding this point that we do not ever anticipate that this would replace the work that is done with the Global South. We would never, it, we, we, I can't even imagine, and I don't think the, that it would ever get to even the levels of manufacturing that happened in the UK uh, in, until the 80s when manufacturing moved offshore. However, there is um, a great desire, according to the work that we, the, the evidence that we heard from Kate Hills, the CEO of Make It British, for brands, and that's both big and small, to bring or return part of their manufacturing to the UK. She has seen an 83% increase in requests to onshore since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's also uh, because of Brexit, as well as because of the pandemic. Obviously, less people want to go to um, China for travel for work or to overseas. They want to work locally. Equally, they might want to sample in this country and take their manufacturing um, and larger quantity uh, uh, production out of the UK. But there is definitely a growth of interest at the same time as there is less capacity than there was pre-Brexit. There has been a massive decrease in um, of around 25 percent is the evidence that we've heard of the capacity. Um, and this happened for some of the factories we spoke to literally overnight the day after the referendum, some of their workers just went home and they're primarily from Eastern Europe. They felt unwelcome and they wanted to go home. Because, um, because a garment worker earns in the majority under the limit at the moment of 25,600, um, both us at Fashion Roundtable and actually with our other APPG, we did a lot of work around what's called the shortage occupation list and garment factory owners such as Jenny Holloway, the CEO of Fashion Enter, where she pays very transparently her workers um, between 12 to 17 pounds an hour. Due to a tech platform that they use called Galaxia, she is able to track who made what, for how long, in what conditions, etc. cetera. Um, but she can't get workers either. Um, currently, you cannot come here for, for um, work now um, that we are out of the EU and the majority of the workers come from the EU. In the meantime, the government didn't speed up the, um, the training of being offered to, to domicile talent to become uh, garment workers, that those T levels will be rolled out in September 23. When the, um, when the Leicester scandal um, occurred, and, and thanks to the work of, of actually evidence givers of our own, Labour Behind the Label and others, I asked the Migration Advisory Committee, the MAC, whether or not they had done an impact assessment on whether or not by not adding garment workers to the shortage occupation list, given that there was a rise in the desire to onshore, whether or not they would, um, whether they had done a, a modern slavery assessment, they had not. Equally, just today, I've been in touch with them asking if, if there's been an impact assessment done on PPE production, given that the government committed to 70% made in the UK PPE. And we've recently heard um, in the last two weeks about um, PPE being made by, in Malaysia by slaves. So this, sh this goes to the heart of why onshoring could be supported, should be supported to help us to make, allow for a more transparent and a more um, clear line of supply where it's not um, subcontracted out as, as obviously was what happened in the Rana Plaza disaster and others. Um, but it needs, it needs R&D to support that development. I mean, it's something that Dillis has highlighted in her presentation. 
and um, you know careers go through different stages and it's not something that you can just do for children and then just leave it needs to be there to support either women back into work after children I mean my career certainly changed and I'm not alone in that um, and also it supports the government's leveling up agenda it supports a nationwide opportunity you have an industry that before the pandemic was growing 11 percent year on year um, but it has a lack of um, it never seems to have a, the same amount of attention as others when it comes to policy. Um, so skills development would be vital, especially at a time when the government are looking to cut support for higher education in the arts by 50 percent. Um, the argument being that, of course, they're looking in the wrong direction of where the cuts are given the growth opportunities. When we're talking about the tax incentives, I just want to bring that in because I know we had this question. Um, I um, I uh, I um, just want to add that we did ask Minister Scully about this and um, he's not open to it at the moment. However, I just want to add that the film industry does get tax breaks. Um, if you go to it's it's in our pages of our manifest of our, on our manifesto, sorry, of our presentation, um, it, we outline what the film industry gets and the film industry makes a fraction of what the UK makes. Um, and the reason why this is important is it's growing. It's actually at, um, arguably at capacity at the moment. You not only get um, support from the National Lottery, but they also get the UK tax film relief. So one way of supporting this would be to, to, to mirror and map what is being done for the film industry and allowing that for the UK fashion industry. Personally, I don't think that, that this is something that we're close to because I agree that many other industries are looking at this and I have had conversations with DCMS about this in the past, but there's no reason why certainly with an APPG report we can't put it out there so that we can um, start the conversation um, that myself and others have been have been pushing on. Um, just to track back to how long, how much it takes um, a company to, to train a garment worker, Philip Grant from e Touts, who many of you will know from the BBC Sewing Bee, says that to train a worker in a factory costs him as a factory owner an average of £40,000. Obviously, therefore, he needs talented um, and trained garment workers. Um, I think that the lack of joined up thinking between the decision not to have an occupation on the shortage occupation is such as garment workers, but wanting to onshore, but wanting to level up and not to speed up the T levels was um, gives rise to the ideas of why we feel that by um, making Whitehall more streamlined, make, allowing for a capacity whereby there is one point of entry that you talk to across all the different departments, whether it's in turn to do with environment, education, home office, design or business would, would allow for an ease of not only a red thread of solutions, but also to support different areas where they might differ because of political agendas. Um, and then I just wanted to lastly talk about um, the landscape post uh, post Leicester. Obviously, the, the government, um, like ourselves, we're all very worried about those concerns. But I, uh, but, um, I think this is why adding the garment workers to that list would support support transparency at least, at least until some such time as those workers are educated and into the workforce. Um, the UK has a fantastic heritage in the fashion industry. We had the father of couture, Charles Worth. We have an amazing roster of high-end brands across Savile Row and Mayfair, but equally we have these heritage brands that are, you know, like a tiny cashmere company coming out of Scotland, but we were also leading in innovation. We, we are the best in terms of what's called fashion tech. All of the online platforms have got their headquarters in the UK. Um, but all of those have told us over various conversations that we've had over the last several years that they've felt a lack of support and engagement with government. Um, and I think this has been a consistent theme that we've felt is needs to be raised. Um, if you've got an if you've got a massive increase in the desire to onshore, you've got a government with a leveling up agenda, and you've got a business that's leading in innovation at a time when the there is a, a shared global ambition to reach net zero. This is a perfect storm to not only highlight the issues but offer solutions. And whilst of course we're not saying that everything should be bought here, we don't really make zips or buttons in this country. In the majority, you get cotton thread from Gutterman generally in Germany. Um, 
if you had more support, you could allow for more jobs, but not at the cost. It, it, even if we brought it up um, to say double what it is at the moment, it would still be a, a drop in the ocean for, for, for the global numbers of manufacturing worldwide and would not be at the expense of our partners in Bangladesh or in other territories. And then I'm gonna hand back to the chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara. And I was just about to go into the Q&A because I saw something that directly responds to something that you just now said. Okay, fantastic. Um, which is about, I can't find it now, but I'm sure somebody said that there is one button maker in the country. That's so exactly there you go. True. That's exactly <laughs> true. In fact, I saw it in, in I, I, I not only love fashion, but I love um, uh, interiors but also working with existing so uh, existing products so I get a magazine called Reclaim which is all about using old wood etc it's one of my geeky things and they had an article about one of those I think we have one to two I've heard varying reports zip manufacturers and one button factory so quite clearly even if we had five it's going to be a drop in the ocean but from Jenny Holloway particularly just after we officially left the EU I knew from her the the added costs and implications of her trying to get her thread from Germany and the delays and the escalated costs. So, um, you know, we don't have cotton fat, we don't have cotton farms in this country. We are never going to be 100% end to end, but we do have areas where we could support and grow. And it might be that it's literally the sampling for a global supply chain to deliver the higher volume, but um, it, it, it's definitely something that's been highlighted again and again is, You've got so many people looking to onshore, but um, a lack of thinking in the round doesn't support that very easily for people who are really doing their best in very, very difficult circumstances after Brexit and the pandemic. Thanks for that, Tamara. And you completely undermine your assertion at the beginning that you um, feel like an imposter. I do. You have <laughs> such a deep, <laughs> craziness because you have such deep knowledge of the sector from, from a variety of different angles. Thank so you. please don't undersell yourself. Thank and um, just, just as a general note, before we go into the um, uh, q and I, I, I do want to congratulate the team for producing this report. Um, it's, you know, um, the all party parliamentary group um, exists on very, very small amount of resources. And uh, it's what, what um, uh, people like Tamara can kind of hustle from people and to produce a report of this quality and depth and this amount of rigor, I think is to be applauded, even though I probably shouldn't say so as I co-chair the group. But, but seriously, it is um, an excellent report and I do um, urge people um, to have a look at it. It's very readable too. So now we, we, we come to the uh, Q&A bit, but again, just before we start that, I do want to uh, thank everybody who's spoken. Um, uh, of course, Tamara, but also, and Catherine for, for being a wonderful co-chair and Hilary, Laura, Dillis and uh, Fiola. Thank you all very much for your contributions so far, because now we do actually come to the um, uh, question time. And actually for once, we've got really a decent amount of time. So I do hope, that, that, that you will um, join in on, on this with these questions. I'm going to attempt to um, uh, go through them now. We've got, we've got several and um, okay. So one of the questions which um, was posed by Is Ismay um, Boy Wonder Limited has already been addressed by Tamara. And it's this point about with a number of different industries clamoring for tax breaks and financial support. How likely is it that government will take any of these suggestions on board? So I don't know whether anybody else on the panel would like to say anything about that or whether in, even um, Tamara, if you wanted to add any more to that. From my perspective, um, part of the problem is something that's already been outlined, which is about how government different departments have different aims and objectives, even though they might deal with the same uh, broad subject area. So it is quite difficult to get this, you know, this holy grail of joined up government, whereby you can have a single portal and say, look, this is what we feel the industry needs to be doing over the next five to 10 years. It, it's very difficult actually to do that. Um, uh, but again, you know, as, as, as has already been indicated, it's something that um, uh, uh, we continue to try and um, get some of those um, minds focused on how fashion could be a real, uh, could make a real contribution 
towards solving or producing solutions uh, for some of these really big um, issues and problems. But is, is, is there anybody on the panel who would like to say anything more about um, uh, government and in terms of um, other demands on its time and energy and indeed uh, tax breaks? I'm happy if that's okay, uh, Lola. Please do, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. No, just the reason, uh, look, so I spoke, there's a previous head of design at DCMS, just to get into the mega geekiness of my engagement with the civil service um, in pushing the sector. And his name is Jack Carrot, and he is now at DIT. Um, and I asked him this question and he said, HMRC don't really like the film industry getting these tax breaks. However, I have a husband that works in the film industry who I literally see, I think at the moment, about 18 hours a week because he's so busy and all of the industry are busy. They're actually at capacity um, in the UK and they're building two massive film studios, either one in Dagenham and one in West London. It's, it's massive. It's massive, except it's not making anywhere near the same figures as the UK fashion industry. So there's definitely, it seems from the outside looking in, a a decision about which industries want to be supported. Arguably the BFI have been very, very coherent. I did some digging and the BFI took on another organization that had already organized this incentivization over a decade ago. Um, I think what it would need is an organization that could then, because what happens is the BFI decide who gets the tax breaks if they're producing part or all of their film in the UK. So it would need some work and further research by the fashion industry if this is something that uh, we, we really, really outlined the solutions to in order to manifest it. But I do think that it's something that if we're consistently asking for and we don't leave it to other organisations to propose and it goes in line with sustainability and onshoring and the levelling up agenda. I do think it's something that we should keep asking for and not just stop. But I do want to add the, the proviso that uh, of course everybody wants a tax break at the moment. Of course it's a very attractive idea um, and I know that uh, Maria from Trade talked about it in terms of B Corps in our, her evidence, B Corps in retail. Um, and it's interesting that that comes from a woman in the charity trade where we've, when I think of all of our high streets are full of charity shops or tea rooms. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think there's something to be said for it in those two spaces. And I think the more people that add their voice to this, it, it starts to change. I, I come from things from a campaign head and you start with one voice and you end up with hopefully if you're successful, more voices. And I see that very much in that in that same light. There is no reason why my colleagues in the film industry are thriving while my colleagues in the fashion industry are struggling. There is just no reason, it needs more support. But I, th I think, um, to be fair, and uh, you know, I'm talking about knowledge that I, I knew more about the film industry yes. several years ago than I do now, but I think we're talking about two slightly different things because the, the as I recall, the kind of initial push for subsidy, which is yeah. effectively what it is of, of the film industry, was to uh, provide a stimulus to the industry um, right. because it had gone downhill and the kind of he cultural hegemony of the United States and its film production was seen as a big threat in terms of you know the um, uh, historic um, uh, film industry within this country and therefore this was a real stimulus to getting those companies in from overseas to come and make movies here and, and to, um, to stimulate our own industry. So what we're talking about with the fashion industry is something that is, is, is slightly different because I, as I understand it, because what we're saying is we want, um, to put it simplistically, we want the government to reward good work. Yeah. And, uh, to, 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 to reward um, uh, companies that are responsible, accountable, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I mean, it's something that we, we, we need to address and, and discuss as to how, how you actually um, make those comparisons in a way that aren't seen to be kind of like, well, they've got it, so we should have it. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, we've got a bit more work to do on how that, that story is told and, and sold perhaps. But I, I don't want to monopolize that, that question. Is there anybody else on the panel um, who, who would want to say anything about government interventions in terms of incentive, incentives um, 
just shout out because I can't see anybody really at the moment. Oh, yeah, I can see people now. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, Dillis, you want to say something? Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Lola. Hi. I, th I do think, uh, I mean, I I'm a bit of an optimist, I, th I know, but I do think that three things. One, the visibility of the fashion sector and the fact that we are already seeing that in other countries, there's, so the second thing is the sort of relativity, you know, whether it's in Denmark, where there's huge uh, government support for the industry around sustainability, whether it's in France, where there's a huge new infrastructure around sustainability and, and small businesses that's just been set up. And obviously the Fashion Pact was, was, was set up by a French president as well. I think that those two things, the visibility and the fact that others are seen to be doing things, are hopefully good incentives for this government to see the value in doing uh, something. But I also get back to what you were just saying, Lola, that, that but it is also true that the fashion industry used to be much more uh, vibrant in the UK, even in my, in my in, yeah, showing my, my age, when I, when I graduated, I did most of my production in London. I sourced buttons, zips, fabric, and, and manufacturing, whether it was jersey or tailoring. So the, the, the demise of the fashion industry um, is something that's very real. And um, by looking at it from a different angle, and, and especially when we're talking about reuse, we're talking about new kind of systems and, and models and using technology. The um, Fostering Sustainable Practices Project, which is May from Boy Wonder is part of, uh, is a huge evidence base of the fact that other, other things do exist. And it's not about just making each of them bigger, but actually supporting them collectively and seeing the importance of small and micro uh, businesses that collectively contribute hugely to the economy. Yeah, I mean, and, and that is a good point because also in my lifetime, but it, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's an ongoing conversation and we have to try and find different ways of being strategic in this in order to convince government that it, it should do what we see as the right thing. I'm going to move on now because it would... Uh, questions are really building up in the Q&A. We have a number. So I'm going to move on quickly now to the next question I got here, which is from Joe Little, who asks, is, is ne or he, he says that the presentations are great, which we take as read, but he asks, is net zero within planetary, planetary boundaries or is it a case of winning slowly but still losing? That is, is net zero in danger of simply becoming a license to do less bad rather than, a, than create a positive fashion footprint? Who would like to have a go at that? Perhaps Dillis, would you like to start on that one and then, and then we'll move around? Hi Lola, thank you. I'm very happy to, to start on that. I'm sure other people want to say things as well. So um, I think that the, the less bad, more good uh, conversation is a really important one. But I think uh, uh, we have to look at where lots of different businesses are currently and uh, applaud change appropriately. So a big business can't change everything overnight, whereas a small business can start out with a completely different trajectory of balancing prosperity across the, the four areas that we've talked about and, and, and putting everything within the context of environmental prosperity. But I think that we have to be careful not to support greenwashing, but at the same time, recognize that the big businesses can't change everything overnight and to be able to look at a, um, a, a mapping of change that is that's committed to and that the government supports because uh, otherwise we'll, we'll just be you know, the small businesses will be outsized by the big guys carrying on as they are so I mean at the center we look at this idea of, of scales of transformation and we look at awareness raising we look at new product services and systems and then we look at this idea of of, of actually basing prosperity on a, on a paradigm of, of environment first and I think you've got to work across that system and have lots of different interventions simultaneously um, it's not a one it's, it's not a sort of one answer and if we only expect business big businesses to completely change immediately there'll be inertia and they won't do it and they'll just look for for ways to to get around it so I think we have to work with with change at lots of different levels. I think we'll come back to this issue of, of size and and then the um, uh, heterogeneity of, of, of the sector uh, later I hope. I will come to Fiola um, uh, to see if, if she would like to address this but just before I do, you mentioned greenwashing, Dillis, and I think it's quite a good moment to say, for those of you who don't know, the Competition Markets Authority, the CMA, 
is currently conducting a consultation trying to find out what consumers or citizens, as I prefer to think of us, uh, what citizens think about these claims that are made um, uh, about environmental sustainability across across the piece, not just within fashion, but across um, a number of sectors. So if you've got something to say on that issue, please do um, get in touch with the Competition um, Markets Authority. And um, Laura has, has um, also offered to talk a little bit about net zero and planetary boundaries, but first I'm gonna come, go to, sorry, uh, Viola. Yes. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with Dillis. I think there needs to be like a slow transition towards these sustainable practices. Um, and um, yes, for big firms who have conducted business as usual for such a long time, it's not reasonable to expect that they can change everything overnight. Uh, so, and the current economic system does reward profit. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So this is, I think, the best that we can do right now. Mm, good, good, good um, point. And I think the issue of profit, again, is, is something which is kind of up for grabs, though, now. Um, I think increasingly people are seeing more than just financial uh, profit. It comes back, I can't remember, I think it might have been Dillis who, who mentioned earlier about prosperity and well-being being something that is not just about financial uh, prosperity, which is really important. I want to go now to, to Laura, who, who would like to say something on this. Laura, over to you, please. Hi, hi, Joe. Just to um, address your question about is net zero within planetary boundaries. Um, so net zero was created um, and during the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Accord to keep climate change below 1.5 degrees C. Um, you may have seen Greta Thunberg saying that we don't need net zero, we need real zero. The issue with net zero is that you can um, reduce your emissions within, um, in line with current um, scientists and, uh, you know, how they're saying to reduce things, and then you can offset the rest of your emissions. And this, this is the issue with net zero as opposed to um, real zero. And planetary boundaries actually um, are nine boundaries that include climate change and that is um, whether boundaries are within safe limits, beyond safe limits, um, sorry they're within, sorry I've got it up here, below, um, below the boundary which is safe, they're in the zone of uncertainty or they're beyond the zone of uncertainty. So they're slightly different metrics that are looking at, at that but I would say that um, if you're looking at net zero versus real zero what we really need is people to be very transparent about how they're going towards net zero and saying how they are, you know, what percentage they are um, offsetting compared to what they are reducing. Thanks very much, uh, Laura. That's really helpful. Um, I'm going to go on now to um, the next question, which is one that often comes up. It's again from Ismay, uh, Boy Wonder Limited. Um, it's important to focus on reducing production as much as consumption, as it can't just be about be about pushing the responsibility onto the consumer. With this in mind, I, that is he or she, am considering a, a, a limited production commitment. Is this something that could work within the industry? Who would like to, to look at that? So it's about shifting the focus or keeping the focus on producers as opposed to consumers and, and how might that work? Would, who, who would like to come in on that? Just jump in any Hillary is that you I see wanting to say something about that I can't hear you you're saying something but you're on mute that's right okay. I saw Dillis is going to jump in so I'll let you go jump oh okay in. okay just, just jump in because I can't see everybody on my tiny little phone so um uh Dillis jump no, in Hillary you I've, I've already spoken a lot you um you know I'm, I'm happy to speak about this but Hillary you go first <laughs> oh right okay Hillary go first then okay yeah yeah, I'll just start off. I think I think a key part of the um, hopefully um, comes out within the report as well, that a key part that we do put a lot of um, focus on is the need for the um, reducing the production level, um, especially in the environmental section. Um, you know, that's what a lot of the EAC um, fixing fashion report kind of try to look at is the actual volume um, that is produced. And I think there's a lot of ways in which we can do that. Obviously, the extended producer responsibility will start to is, is a way of starting to put that responsibility onto the people onto the brands and um, how much they produce um, in terms of uh, considering a limited production commitment I think that's you know that's definitely a potential it's it, again it's that it's that weighing up of um, 
legislation versus what brands will um, commit to themselves. And I think it's it, there's something potential there, but I think maybe I personally, I think it's more of a, it might be need, need to be sort of legislative, but I think that's something that's too tricky to do um, to you know, state how many things you should be producing. But I think once it, as the EPR would do is start to put that onus onto them. So they have to own the whole um, length of each item. And so if they have to be responsible for how it, what happens to each of those billions of items that they you know, millions of items they produce at the end of time at the end of their life of that item, then they will start thinking about are they producing too many if they've got to be responsible for it down the down the whole of the line for every single item. So that's mm. my thoughts on that. So I'll pass to you, Dillis, if you've got more. <laughs> Thanks, Hilary. That, uh, that's a great point. And uh, picking up one, what you said, Lola, about the idea of, of, of well-being and prosperity and doing well, um, I will, I'll come back to, you know, th we've, we've just had two and a half years of, of working on research around this idea of sustainable prosperity by looking at fashion businesses, including Boy Wonder. And what we found is that a lot of these businesses, either the uh, designers have hybrid identities, and we know from the creative industries that that happens across the creative industries, but it's a very purposeful hybrid. Um, so rather than only focusing on their roles as making stuff, they, they use their creative talents in a number of different ways. And so that means that they have a really robust model for their businesses, um, but it isn't just about making more things. So again, that's, that's an, an example of a sort of prototype that, that, that could be looked at um, across other parts of the industry. Um, but I think also this idea of, of how much is enough, and I know this is, this is a bigger conversation and talking about the four day working week, talking about the balance between um, our home lives and our working lives, and particularly with the pandemic where people are actually working even longer hours um, and un, uh, I'm finding it difficult to switch off or people who have suddenly find themselves out of work and realizing that they, they um, haven't had a chance before to be able to get that balance. I think there's a, there's a huge piece of work to be done around the rebalancing of how much time we spend at work and how we spend that time at work um, and whether it is producing stuff, whether it's producing, whether it's looking at after um, employees, etc. And I think there's a lot that particularly um, if we talk about female employment and work, I mean, I could go on, you know, what's valued, what's recognized in, in, in work is not necessarily what's most important. And despite everything that's gone on um, with the, the caring um, um, roles in, in, during pandemic, we're still at this position where the, the, um, the recognition of valuable work is not really uh, front of mind with government. So I'm be very keen to, to, to uh, pursue this conversation uh, further as well. Yeah, but like, like so many others, um, I, I think the thing is that um, there can be a tendency, not, not within our circles as it were, but the, the, there's a tendency perhaps within government, dare I say, which sees, and, and maybe other policymakers too, which doesn't dig enough beneath the surface of what we're talking about. And I think some of those more in-depth conversation, whether that be about historical roots of the problem or whether that be about these overlays of racism and discrimination and misogyny um, or indeed colonial history, you know, the, 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 in order to understand how we got to where we are, we need to think a bit more deeply and, and, and to have that conversation out there so that we can see a, that things do change, like they're not fixed in stone, um, and, and, and B, that we, we need to um, perhaps rethink some of the questions that we're asking of ourselves. Anyway, I've got a question here, and I'm going to address it in the first instance. So this is from Sylvia, and I hope it, Ito Ito, oh, that's right, I was, I was going Ito too. No, I think it's Ito Ito, and Sylvia, um, is asking a question as to whether the work that she, some of the work that she's doing would fall within scope. So she's into extending the life of, of, of clothes, of course, but um, her business is making bags by upcycling synthetics from her immediate local area, which is in Wales, including uh, bicycle inner tubes, camping mattresses, paddling pools, tents, etc., etc no recycled um, uh, content, not clothing, not textiles, but first tier labor conditions untraceable, very, but very low impact, local extended use of materials. Well, you know, um, I'm the kind of person uh, who would always say yes, 
because I think that the more um, people that are kind of allied together, um, the, the more change we, we can affect. But I do understand that, so for example, I'm um, um, ambassador for Textiles 2030 with RAP, and um, that is limited, that, that, that program, that initiative is, is, is restricted to textiles. And so I don't think within that um, uh, particular um, uh, heading, uh, uh, the, the, what you're doing, uh, Sylvia, I think the name is, yeah, um, uh, you know, would be included. However, I'd like to think that within uh, uh, the APPG, we're kind of of a broad church. So if somebody's making bags from bicycle tires, best of luck to you. Um, Tamara, what, what would be your response to that? And, and, and quite, you know, joking aside, it is an interesting question because where does somebody who's doing that kind of work situate themselves in order to, to have the same kinds of conversations and um, uh, looking at different kinds of business models, et cetera, et cetera. Where does somebody working in that sort of area come? I think it goes to an interesting point, doesn't it? Where you talk about where do you draw the line? And I think this is, it's linked in a way to why I, this paper and, and the work that we do outside of working with the APPG has, has consistently shown that the lack of a sectoral approach by the civil service is allowing for so many things to fall between the gaps. I think that what Sylvia is doing is absolutely incredible and should be encouraged. But as she's just said in the chat, she's excluded from RAP. So I know that RAP are on this call. And I think that that's something that, you know, we can, because we're also signatories to RAP 2030. I, I think this is something we could bring up with them because what is a material? If, if Sylvia has decided it's a handbag, it's a handbag without wanting to sound like I'm in an Oscar Wilde play. It's a handbag. <laughs> and... Uh, and all good luck to her for using that. There are some fantastic brands coming out of Germany that have used repurposed rubber. So she's not alone in, in seeing that design and innovation doesn't look at something simply because it was a dress or it was um, something before. People use curtains in new ways. These, this, this is what creative thinking does. It finds solutions. And I think I've seen a lot of what the chat's saying is we're looking at how do we extend, how do we repurpose? And that goes to the heart of people who've been trained to be critical creative thinkers which is why um, in the paper we've talked about the stem education agenda versus steam education um, of the last 10 years which has led to the drop of people from the uk going into some of these some of these careers so i think it's all to the power of, of i mean the solutions are in the chat and in the people who are speaking to us so i mean look sylvia we are at such early days of looking at this if there was a british film institute for the fashion industry i think we would have got further along with all of these different conversations um, and maybe that's a role that we could take up it's certainly something i'm very passionate about and um and i certainly wouldn't be precluding someone who used bicycles to make uh, handbags or camping equipment or any other things I mean you know during the war wasn't silk used to make parachutes and so you know and people were giving in their old clothes so it's it's all about repurpose and restructuring and that calls for critical creative thinking where it's such early days at looking at this you know Paul Scully is not going to change his mind on this it might be a change of government before we even ever got there so let's start looking at how we could create that manifesto for change and then giving it to the government but i definitely wouldn't preclude anything at this early, very early stage yeah and as as i would say on, on a personal le level absolutely not notwithstanding my role with rap um, i also feel that rubber is particularly interesting because again when you look at the old trade routes you know, we're kind of replicating some of those old colonial trade routes here. And uh, so therefore, you know, when you think about um, uh, the people that were impacted then and the people that are impacted largely now, we're talking about a very broadly similar uh, uh, group of people. And so we've still got loads and loads of um, uh, work to do um, in that uh, respect. Um, there's... Um, We'll move on now. I'm going to try and um, ask some questions that have been asked by people who haven't previously um, asked a question. OK, here's one from Linda um, uh, referring to the recent pandemic. And I think it's an interesting one um, because it's not about fashion per se, but about the industry, garment industry. 
So the hubs came together during the pandemic overnight to produce scrubs for the NHS. We would like to see the government support hubs to support local hospital trusts. Um, benefits to uh, UK include UK jobs, cut carbon um, footprint, flexible employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you, that is us, can we help with a sustained and supported lobby to our government to lobby the NHS, especially the newly appointed head of procurement, to buy British and support local economies? Um, again, you know, um, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting subject because it's slightly to one side, as it were. But I, I recently came across a statistic which was actually given to me by, by RAP colleagues, which um, says that the professional clothing market, because we always focus on fashion. And, you know, when we're talking about a potential adjudicator, we're talking about garments as, as a whole. So the professional clothing industry is a market that's worth something like £8.7 billion. That is a substantial amount of money. And again, when you start to think about the extent to which public bodies are involved in those kinds of that kind of where um, uh, whether that's the armed services or the emergency services or, or whatever whatever there's a huge amount of um, a potential role for government to play in in making that sector more sustainable but but does anybody want to address this issue around um, uh, hubs for producing PPE etc who, who would like to go first on that if, it, if it's okay with you, Lola, because I've done so much work around PPE, it's Tamara here. Okay, okay. Um, if you want to, to start yeah. us off then, Tamara, yeah. and then I'll go yeah. to other members of the panel. Yeah, exactly, because this I, I feel more able to speak on than other, other questions that have come in. Um, Linda, I think it's a really important conversation and it actually goes to the heart of some um, work that we're still doing. So during the beginning of the pandemic, myself and other British um, facing organisations such as Make It British um, worked very closely pro bono giving advice to the government about how to create end-to-end -end UK manufacturing for PPE. We also supported um, the voluntary organisations such as the Emergency Designer Network where a number of designers um, and manufacturers in the end ended up volunteering. Um, I've recently been in touch with the government because um, private VC, private white VC have had to mothball their production for PPE because they were not getting orders. They never got any orders or very many orders. So I should provide that they did get some, but not very many orders from the UK NHS um, and they ended up exporting. And equally, um, the news recently has been that PPE um, from Malaysia, which has been part of the slave, uh, been made under slave conditions, has ended up in, the, in UK usage. We also raised the issue which Lord Young um, spoke to us about earlier um, in the private chat for panellists about what about the single usage use of PPE. This was something we also raised with the government. The reason that they had gone to that was simply down to price. A lot of this has been down to price. Last year, uh, the Prime Minister at one of the uh, daily uh, briefings said that it was an intention of the UK government to reach 70% UK made PPE. Um, we've asked the government for what the number is now. We're still waiting for an answer. I've been pushing on that quite heavily over the last couple of weeks. It is nowhere near 70%. Um, I did hear from a consultant who worked for the government that if they got it to 40%, they would be happy. I don't think we're even at 40%, but I've asked for answers on that. I've also asked the Migration Advisory Committee whether there was an impact assessment done on what having non-UK made manufacturing of PPE meant in terms of um, exploitation across the supply chain of that, for which I'm still waiting for an answer. So in answer to the situation, the UK is different. It's obviously got devolved nations. In Scotland, the NHS dealt directly uh, with the with the manufacturers so they were able to shore up their orders very quickly um, in in the UK it was it was it was it was different Deloitte did a lot of the ordering of the PPE um, so I would welcome everybody and perhaps if we could get Anne Eden's email maybe we could draft draft up a copy and paste letter that people could send to her or to their MPs to email Anne Eden um, but it is something that apparently the UK government is keen to keen to have which is UK made PPE however they haven't met their own targets and, nor, and, and my worry is they haven't done an impact assessment on 
on not having UK made PPE and therefore it being made under exploitative practices. Um, and I think that the issue is that pricing has been the primary driver rather than extended use because the reasons that they did not use re, uh, reusable PPE was down to the dry cleaning, but we gave them all of the solutions of that. We, get, we gave them links to um, how to get involved with the dry cleaning process with, with, by the way, a green dry cleaning process, which would have eradicated the need for social single use. Um, we had instances where there was a manufacturer and a producer with 10 miles between them and one was in, was exporting to America who were buying up all the PP very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic and one was having to import those materials from overseas. Amara, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I think, you know, this is a, obviously you have a huge amount of knowledge on this subject yeah. and, and there, there, think, there's a lot yeah. that can be said about this and maybe this is something. Yeah, that, I think. The answer, know, yeah. PPP, but I just want to make sure that can bring in some other panellists. To all I want to say in answer is the answer is in what you've asked and the answer is to lobby our need and, and to ask her those very questions but there is no clarity from government on their own provisos that they set out as targets last year. Uh, Fiola I think did you want to come in on this? Sorry I thought I, I thought I saw no, no. you with your hand up. No? Mm, no I think I'm oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry did anybody else on the panel then want to come in on this? I would just add, I, I think when I saw that question, I thought um, where, where it said, can you help with a sustained and supported lobby to our government on this? And I thought, yes, Tamara probably can. So I think she was the perfect person to answer that. So I think that's pretty much summed it up. OK, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, we've got 16 or so questions, so I'm trying to get through as many as possible. And as I say, without repeating um, people, there, there, there's a couple here that kind of like it feels like they're in parallel to each other because there's somebody I can find them again now that there's somebody saying, you know, in FE, we're really willing and, and able to train up. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, the college sector are desperate to recruit students in FE colleges. Um, running HE programs and would happily partner with garment suppliers to train up garment workers, yet we fail to make meaningful connections and hit brick walls when we try, try to engage with our local industry. And so the, the question, which is from Rebecca O'Leary, um, ends by saying talented garment makers are in the UK college system now, support these students by implying them. And then the next um, uh, uh, question is from Linda. As an on-demand manufacturer whose business is growing, we are desperate for people who can sew, happy to train, but would like to know that people have basic skills. Please, can we lobby government to include basic sewing skills as a GCSE um, a subject? So I think these are kind of interconnected and it goes to, you know, this whole sort of paradigm of, sort of supply and demand. And it's a bit like, as, as, as Tamara was saying, you know, you've got um, two companies not, not far away from each other in that PPE situation. Um, and so how can we, how can we, um, um, how can we, how can we act more sensibly on this? And as I, even as I say that, I feel that although I think it should be the state's responsibility to have a strategic plan which engages with STEAM rather than simply STEM, but you know that to some extent feels like a lost battle. But by the same token, I sometimes feel that we can just, you know, people within the sector can make those connections and get on and do it, actually. And, and maybe there's a different way round of trying some of these things, but it does seem a shame that on the one hand, there's a group of institutions saying we can get people who, who have these skills. And then on the other hand, there's a, another group of people are saying, I can't get people with these skills to do this work. What is going on and why isn't it working more effectively? Um, who, who would like to say something on, on that? I, th I think it actually relates to, or could relate very much to the whole issue of the just transition. So I'm wondering if perhaps this time, Fiola, you wanted to say something about that, trying to make those connections um, between these different groupings and maybe not sort of thinking, oh, it's got, we've got to wait for government to do something. Yes, definitely. I think um, there's room for the industry to work with academia in this case. Uh, to solve this problem um, and if they say that there are skilled workers to be hired then the industry should hire them 
So I think because I was reading another question, I think it was later on that there is also a demand for workers in the UK by firms who produce here. So there seems to be quite a room for an improved communication between the industry and academia to have this sorted out. Great. And, and Laura, if I may come to you, um, I'm, I'm assuming that, that, you know, if we could sort out some of these issues, this would be a really good contribution towards net zero, however we want to define or, or, or think about that. Yes, I'm sorry, I was just typing in the uh, reply to Joe's question at the same time, doing two things. Um, yes, when you, when you, if we think about educating consumers and people who may want to go into the industry, once you start trying to make a shirt, you realise how hard it is to make a shirt and then that shirt gains more value to you. So there's a few different ways I think that we could we could approach this to maybe get people more interested in studying. So I studied fashion at, at school and at university and I had this click of inspiration that made me want to do it. So how can we also generate this click of inspiration that make people want to go and learn these amazing things from Dillis and other people. So what I was saying to Joe is um, he asked um, about how do we unlock the value of raw materials at the garments end of life the best way to do that is to design that in at the beginning of the life of the garment so we really need to look at this in a really holistic way so to inspire people so maybe it's up to brands to communicate a little bit more how to how to mend their clothes or to support the the repair industry I don't know if I've completely just <laughs> not really answered your question now but I hope that's that's a helpful response no that it is absolutely, absolutely. And because I think, you know, none of these, as I was saying earlier, none of these questions are just kind of a single layer of question. They're kind of multi-layered. I'm also trying to multitask here slightly. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, I'm just about on top of it. So um, uh, I'm looking at the questions now and I'm trying to sift through because I saw one that was a little bit different. I'm trying to get to some, perhaps some slightly different issues. Although I do note that there's a lot of, well, I don't know about a lot, but there's certainly a significant number of, of people who do wish um, that the government would step in and make some um, really decisive interventions here. And of course, the APPG, um, part of its rationale is to uh, make those arguments to um, uh, uh, government. So, you know, we do note all of these. Um, ba -ba 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 Okay, here's one from Tradecraft Exchange. It would be good to hear to what extent it's possible for smaller fashion businesses, many of which are innovating in environmental space or aiming to pay live, living wages, being able to compete with the garment retailers selling to the mass market owned by the billionaires. Mass market retailers can treat their suppliers unfairly because of the power imbalance. We probably need to distinguish between mass market retailers and the smaller retailers within the fashion space. And I think that's a very good point and it relates to something I was going to say later and sort of alluded to earlier, which is that the fashion sector is not, you know, one monolithic sector. So I know, Dillis, that you've been doing a lot of work with, um, uh, you've changed the acronym around, haven't you? You've made it micro and small enterprises, just to confuse me further. So it's MSE instead of SME. Would, would you like to say a little bit about the distinctions between those two approaches? Yes, thank you, Laura. Yeah, sorry. Um, we because we found that a lot of the people we've been working with are micro um, and there's a lot of emphasis on small and medium and actually micro, small and medium businesses. Um, we wanted to expand it to that. But um, I, yeah, I, I completely agree, yeah, Lola, that the fashion sector is lots of different kinds of sectors and draws on lots of different disciplines. And there, there does need to be, a, a, on the one hand, a distinction between what some of these small businesses, how, how they work and what they do and the bigger businesses but on the other hand actually if we can find better ways for each to learn from each other um because there 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 is potential support that the big businesses can give to the small ones um and vice versa so i think the sort of synergies between the large and the small um is is also something that we, we have to be very careful about because a lot of small businesses are worried about bigger businesses copying them um, and that's suddenly, you know, from a historic perspective, a real problem in the fashion sector and copying is, is a whole nother 
conversation we could have. But I think that actually now we, as particularly actually maybe with, with the last 18 months, a lot of these small businesses are creating ways of doing things that the big businesses can't do. So Birdsong are, are, are one of the uh, businesses that, that are uh, cited in the report. So is Phoebe English. These people have direct relationships with their customers. They are trusted because they have those direct relationships. They also then get to know what their customers think, need and want in a very direct way, that, which means that they can make things that are right for them. So some of those things, you, you know, the, the big guys can't mm -hmm. copy. So I think there, there is a distinction already in uh, what the small businesses are doing. Um, and so that if, if that's celebrated and recognized, which is where our work around fostering sustainable practices really, you know, that's why we focus on this last two and a half years in creating an evidence base of what's happening at that small scale, because there's all sorts of exemplars of, of ways, whether it's crowdsourcing design that then is only put into production, so it's it's on demand design, whether it is looking at um, an ecosystem that is, that is very localized, Phoebe's looking at um, you know, a fibre shed around um, a certain part of the UK. These these are new models of businesses that are very specific to a particular size of business and they can't be sized up and shouldn't be sized up. But at the same time, I think that a lot of bigger businesses could think in a more networked way rather than the hierarchical way. I mean, I think this person from Tradecraft has sort of hit the nail on the head. The, the, the problem of the fashion system is a power imbalance in the fashion system, which goes back to what you're saying, Lola, about um, issues to do with the colonial uh, background to the system. It, it's, you know, it's, it's based on exploitation. Um, so uh, we, we, we do have to find legislation that's going to support change as well as supporting good practice. But I would also say just a fight to the sort of final thing, you know, um, a big business is still it's people, whatever the size of the business, it's people. And we do work with design teams in very large businesses in the UK and in other places. And those design teams are absolutely adamant that they want to do good, good work. Um, just as a small design business is. So being able to support design and design practice is something that I think is also overlooked. There's another question about buying practices, which is important, but I think that other, other parts of the fashion industry and other parts of the, of the world recognize the value of design more than uh, it is recognized in the UK. So mm -hmm. going back to education, which goes back to the STEAM agenda. Um, and I think that un until I think we do need to keep pushing this because otherwise all we're going to do is create these efficiencies that uh, overall do not reduce consumption. They do not reduce resource use. Just recycling something and, and keeping producing more and more. It's, it's not a, a, a zero sum game. It's 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 we've got to be honest and realistic about that. Thank you. I'd like to bring um, Hillary in. Um, I mean, earlier you were talking about the modern slavery act. And the, and the Uyghur crisis and and yet you know to well if we look at the the modern slavery act um the uh, transparency and supply chains isn't even applicable to businesses with a turnover smaller than 36 million so I mean what 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 would be your sort of feeling around that there are a number of businesses actually quite large businesses as well as smaller businesses who have said that the uh, transparency and supply chains threshold should be zero so that everybody, but what, what's your kind of instinctive uh, response to that? Yeah, I mean, I think more than anything, as Dillis has spoken to, that would often, that would often represent a, you know, they, they demonstrate how much better they are often in, in, in the, you know, the impressive and innovative working practices that they have um, would potentially be, um, you know, demonstrated if they were, if they were to do that. I think I would probably say it definitely, I would personally think it needs to be reduced significantly. I wouldn't necessarily say it needs to be reduced. You know, obviously you've got to start looking at how small businesses run. Does that add much, you know, there's a, there, there is a greater capacity for bigger businesses to um, have the, you know, the administrative capabilities to fill out those and to create those um, for their work. I think it does need to be, I think it needs to be reduced significantly, but then for those micro businesses, is that, um, is that relevant to them and is, is that possible for their for their for their business to to run? I don't know what Dillis thinks to that, but I think I'd like to link it up to what um another question that Tradecraft Exchange had um about yeah, about I think which Dillis touched upon about um purchasing practices and does that drive harmful outcomes both in re uh, relation to environmental and social consequences? And I think yes, yeah, that the paper pretty much you know, the paper talks about how that very much the 
harmful purchasing practices push suppliers to the extent that they then that then the the um, environment for um, worker exploitation is created, and I think that is very much controlled by those big brands. They they are pushing down, you know, they're pushing down to a price that they know really will push those suppliers into a position where they are pushing, uh, uh, creating worker exploitation problems. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think there needs to be recognition of the, you know, the innovation that small smaller businesses are doing. And I I, I wonder whether that's um, them being allowed to be part of the Modern Slavery Act. I think if anything, they'd probably make the num make the numbers more impressive on the Modern Slavery Act and look like people are doing better. And we do really need to focus on those um, bigger businesses, um, but it's definitely something to consider. Thanks for that. Any, anybody else want to come in on that? Tamara, do you want to say anything, add anything to that issue about the smaller businesses? I think we have to start somewhere. So if we start with the big businesses, I mean, this is my instinctive reaction. Um, I haven't got a whole big speech on it, but I think that, you know, you have to start somewhere. And on, on, on the Modern Slavery Act 2015, that was the that was the line in the sand, wasn't it, that was agreed. So, um, you know, the, the numbers of the turnover of small business in the, and the people, amount of people, as, as Delis alluded to, and I've, I've checked this with ONS stats because I, I read them on, on, my, on my time off <laughs> um, for fun. And it's true. Most of us do work for small businesses and, and, and most of the money in the UK actually comes from small business. And what's interesting is policy is often directed towards bigger business. Um, so there's a disconnect there. But I think we have to start somewhere. Um, and there is, as Dillis's work has shown, encouraging steps within the smaller business uh, industry, uh, sector. You've got everything from Phoebe English looking at how to really produce in a very small um, vicinity and even using milk product to make her hangers. I mean, extraordinary innovations happening in smaller businesses that need support the UK fashion industry, whether it's been the high street or high end has, has had a crash and burn mentality, both towards its workers and towards its own brand image. And that is, is what we were keen to address in this paper. Um, and just to say that we very much focused on UK policy. We were very aware of the, of the global landscape whether it's the UN or the EU where things are being done differently, but very much this paper is a UK focused paper. Great. Uh, I've got a question here, which is, um, uh, again, an interesting one because it's on a slightly different track to, to what we've been discussing so far. And it's from Andrew Loder, who essentially is asking, away from supply chains and manufacturing, is there a plan for tackling the huge levels of unpaid workers regularly uh, record, being recruited into the various office and studio based roles, primarily right on UK's fashion doorstep? in London. So not, not, not a set of unpaid uh, workers that we um, often uh, discuss. Um, so, so what's happening here? And should that be seen as something which is just as um, um, uh, awful as unpaid workers at, at a factory in, in, in Leicester? Who would like to come in on this one? Hilary, to... are, you, are you making signs that you want to say something? No, again, that was me nodding towards Dillis. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <okay. laughs> I'm too emotive with my face, I think. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dillis, okay, jump in then. Um, from a uh, University of the Arts perspective and, and, and speaking to colleagues at other universities around the UK, you know, this is a, this is a huge issue. Um, and uh, I think that certainly unpaid internships uh, whilst studying are something that a lot of universities are now being really careful around uh, to ensure that uh, their students are not finding themselves in those places and and certainly the University of the Arts and other universities as well uh, may, uh, have tutors that are looking very specifically at ensuring that, uh, that, that students are not in un unpaid internships. Um, uh, obviously, once somebody graduates and then trying to find a job, and if there's no jobs, the the uh, the sort of what they call the the fire pit or the the I can't, there's an, there's another term that what happens to a lot of people after they graduate but before they find employment is that they are already in huge debt and then they have to take unpaid internships. It it sh it shouldn't be legal. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe come back to you, Lola, on 
on legislation around that. Uh, because I think, yeah, there's shark pool, that's it, the, you know, whilst somebody's in, in study, hopefully they are supported by their universities or their colleges or the places where they're, they're based to ensure that, that they don't uh, get exploited um, and they do get paid um, uh, properly for the work that they're doing. The, I think the problem is for recent graduates, uh, particularly now um, when the, the industry has shrunk. So I think that there needs to be more support. There needs to be more um, expo exposés. Media has been good at exposing some businesses around that. So I think it, we, we, we do need to, to make that very, very, very clear. Thank you very much. And, and sadly, all of a rush, it seems like we've come to the end of the afternoon. It feels like we could go on for a lot of time. A uh, lot longer, and indeed, there's probably about 15 or 16 questions that we haven't even uh, looked at so far. So, um, thank you. It, it's down to me to say thank you to everybody. But I, I would like, rather than me pontificating for the next four minutes, I'm going to ask each member of the um, uh, panel just to, in three words. So you've got to be really, really dif disciplined here. Just three words to sum up what the top priority should be in, 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 as far as you're concerned, entirely personal or representing your organization or institution or whatever, but just in three words, and, and this is gonna be your, your sign off, so make them good. Um, I'm gonna start with, who should I start with? I think I'm gonna start with um, Tamara. Three words, Tamara, to um, send us off with. Stop thinking in silos. Right. Stop thinking in silos. Okay, that's four, but I'll let you no. off because you, you, you wanted the in to be not counted. Had, yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well done. Dillis, three words. Foster sustainable prosperity. <laughs> you, what, what did you, could you say it more slowly, please? <sighs> Foster sustainable prosperity. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Hilary. I'm going to say on mute. end exploitative practices. That's my Great. Well done. Uh, Laura. My words don't go together. Sorry. <laughs> <That's all laughs> I right. one out. Uh, mine was responsibility, regeneration and future. Excellent. Well done. And last but not least, of course, Fiola. Uh, I was going to say the same one as Hillary, but I'm going to focus on um, stop exploiting workers. Great. So I think that covers a good range of the issues with which we're concerned. And certainly um, our, um, we extrapolate on all of those areas in the report. And that, it really is a good read. It's a, it's a relatively quick read in spite of the fact that it's... Um, or maybe I should say because of the fact that it's very robust and, and rigorous and uh, beautifully designed as you would expect. So I think this is probably for us the, the last um, APPG meeting before we break for the summer. So a really heartfelt thanks to everybody who's participated on the panel. Um, Catherine, although she's not, not here, uh, I'd also like to say thanks again for her wonderful co-chairpersonship. Uh, to Tamara and the team for all the enormous amount of hard work they've done over this past year. And to our panelists today, Hilary, Laura, Fiola, and again, another special mention for Dillis, who has been my mentor since I think about 2009, just before we we started the um, all party parliamentary group on ethics and sustainability in fashion. And she sort of held my hand, sometimes I think literally as well as metaphorically across that, that period. So thanks very much for that and to all her colleagues at the Centre for Sustainability, uh, for Sustainable Fashion, I beg your pardon. And uh, thank you to all of you participants um, uh, for coming along and wonderful, wonderful questions. And uh, we hope we'll be able to keep in touch with you and, and uh, uh, refresh ourselves over the break and come back raring to go in September, October. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye everyone.